Welcome to Cinematic Excrement, and the next chapter in my quest to review every film that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. Last time, we looked at the first film to win this honor, 1980's Can't Stop the Music. And today, we move ahead to 1981. A lot of good movies came out in 1981, including, but not limited to, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Superman 2, For Your Eyes Only, Stripes, and The Great Muppet Caper. But it also gave the Golden Raspberry Foundation plenty of fodder, as their worst picture nominees included Endless Love, based on and by all accounts far inferior to the novel of the same name, The Legend of the Lone Ranger, a box office bomb, and a public relations nightmare due to the producer's treatment of the original Lone Ranger, Clayton Moore, Tarzan the Ape Man, which had to replace its lead actor with his stunt double at the last minute, and Heaven's Gate, which single-handedly bankrupted a major studio and began the demise of the new Hollywood movement. Hold on, you might say. Wasn't Heaven's Gate released in 1980? Well, technically it was, in its original 219-minute version that sent audiences running to the hills. It was then trimmed down to about two and a half hours at great expense and at the last minute, and released to theaters in April of 1981. And this time it lasted for two weeks. Progress? Now, the movie has undergone a critical reevaluation, thanks largely in part to a new cut that director Michael Camino refers to as his definitive version. But even fans of the film will tell you the two and a half hour cut was kind of a mess. And I assume that is the version that was nominated. But despite that film's reputation, it shockingly did not win the Razzie for Worst Picture. That dishonor went to Mommy Dearest. This film was based on the autobiography of the same name, written by Christina Crawford, the adopted daughter of actress Joan Crawford. The book, which was named after what Joan allegedly expected her children to call her, depicts the actress as a controlling alcoholic, prone to severe mood swings and abusive behavior. Needless to say, it ruffled a lot of feathers as it showed people a darker side of the beautiful and talented Hollywood star that they never saw in public, and helped to shine a spotlight on the horrors of child abuse. This, in turn, may have have encouraged the children of other actors like Betty Davis and Bing Crosby to write memoirs about their own horrible childhoods. The publication of the book was not without controversy, and several people who knew Joan have suggested Mommy Dearest is a work of fiction, including her first husband, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and her two youngest adopted children, Cindy and Kathy. While no one disputed her alcoholism or controlling nature, they have suggested the stories of abuse were embellished. On the other hand, several people have verified stories in Christina's book and claim to have even witnessed some of the abuse. Betty Hutton in particular, who was Joan's neighbor for a time, would encourage her own children to play with the Crawford kids as a way of distracting them from the pain in their lives. Christina's younger brother Christopher also claimed the stories were true up until his dying day in 2006. Some suggested Christina wrote the tell-all as revenge for her and Christopher being left out of their mother's will, but this seems unlikely. Several accounts suggest Christina started writing the book while Joan was still alive. It's possible Joan even knew about the book, though she never discussed it with her daughter. As previously stated, Joan and Christina both had plenty of defenders after Mommy Dearest was published. But it's the statements of Joan's defenders I find rather telling. Actress Myrna Loy, Joan's friend since 1925, described Christina as a rather stubborn child, which, for the record, Christina does not dispute, and her defense of Joan doesn't really suggest she did not abuse her daughter, but rather that she was fully justified in doing so. Even if the stories were true, if ever there was a girl who needed a good whack, it was spoiled, horrible Christina. Believe me, there were many times I wanted to smack her myself. Other defenders, like her friend Carlton Barney, described Joan in a similar tone, suggesting, yeah, she may have employed corporal punishment every once in a while, but hey, that sort of thing was totally normal back then. Again, that sounds more like a justification than a dispute. And I'm sure I don't have to spell this out for you, but being acceptable at the time does not magically make it okay. As for Cindy and Kathy, it's entirely possible they were also telling the truth when defending their mother's honor. They may very well have had an amicable relationship with Joan that was free of any abuse. 
I hope that's true, because no child should ever have to go through that shit. But there's also no way they could have known what went on between their mother and older sister. Christina was sent away to boarding school when Kathy and Cindy were two. As for Fairbanks, I don't see how he could have known much either since he and Joan divorced seven years before Christina's adoption. He would have been well out of the picture. So if you're wondering where I stand, I'm pretty firmly in Camp Christina. There's nothing wrong with being a strict parent, but what Christina describes goes well beyond that and is in no way acceptable. But anyway, three years after its publication, Mommy Dearest was made into a motion picture. It was released by Paramount, ironically the only major studio for which Joan Crawford never made a movie, and it seemed like they had a recipe for success. They had an Oscar-nominated director in Frank Perry, and none other than Faye freaking Dunaway was cast to play Joan Crawford. And I will say this much, she had the look of Joan Crawford down. And that didn't happen by accident. She reportedly went through three hours of makeup every day to achieve this look. Nowadays, when you hear about someone spending that much time in the makeup chair every morning, it's because they're playing some kind of alien or fantasy creature. Dunaway was just playing a regular human. Well, perhaps not a regular human, but you know what I mean. Kudos to the hair and makeup department for doing such a great job. But of course, the look is only a small part of what it takes to become another person. Most of it comes from the performance. No more hangers! We'll get to that. The story begins around the time Joan Crawford made the Ice Follies of 1939, so it seems we're starting at a low point, and we get a taste of her relationship with boyfriend-slash-attorney Greg Savitt, played by Steve Forrest, and most likely based on Crawford's on-again, off-again love interest, Greg Boutzer. We also get a taste of the movie's questionable dialogue as Joan demands Greg remove his shoes when he enters her house. What about the socks? I can handle the socks. Oh, I'll bet she can handle the socks, eh, 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 <laughs> I don't know what that means. I guess that's what passed for innuendo in 1939? I know it was a different time, but usually I can still understand old-timey innuendo. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. See? That I understood. Initially, it seems like the film is setting up Joan as a sympathetic character as she describes her previous attempts at having a child with ex-husband French Tone, all seven of which ended in miscarriage. You heard that correct. Seven. And that's just with Francho. Supposedly, she and Doug took a couple of cracks at it as well with similar results. As for why she couldn't carry a child to term, there were rumors of a botched abortion being to blame, but nothing was ever actually proven. But regardless of the reason, I would not wish seven miscarriages on anyone. So she's finally ready to throw in the towel on giving birth, but still wants a child. Unfortunately, in the state of California, the laws at the time pretty much made it impossible for a twice-divorced working woman to adopt a child. And Joan handles this setback with all the grace and poise of a tightrope walker with Parkinson's. Don't you dare judge me. Whatever, you don't know me. What you're really doing is denying one of your children the opportunity to live a wonderful and advantaged life. Well, madam, you've convinced us that we made the right decision. Please take your crazy eyes elsewhere. Thank you. Good morning. This is the point of the movie where you might get the sense that something in Faye Dunaway's performance is a little off. Well, let me just reassure you, it's gonna get worse. No more! We'll get to that. The weird thing is, after that scene at the agency where she is firmly denied an adoption, we immediately cut to Joan's first meeting with her adopted daughter, Christina. How the hell did this happen? I mean, I know how it happened because I've read Joan's Wikipedia page, but I shouldn't have to do that. Would it really have taken that much effort for the movie to tell us she adopted out of state? Obviously not, because I just did it. Give you all the things I never had. Madam, you're rich, you live in a huge ass mansion, and you're a famous Hollywood star. Besides Cary Grant, what have you not had? And from there, we fast forward a few years and pretty much go straight into little Christina's unhappy childhood. It starts off well enough with a birthday party for which the term extravagant seems woefully inadequate, but then, just as she's about to enjoy all of her presents, Joan informs Christina that she can only keep one. 
The rest are going to the orphans. Well, so much for I'm going to give you all the things I never had. Now, at face value, giving toys to children who need them more than you do is not a bad idea. It's a good way to teach your children the value of generosity and selflessness. But maybe don't spring this on them at the last minute so it feels less like generosity and more like theft. Also, the ever-present film crew makes it look less like genuine generosity and more like a publicity stunt. It's one thing if you're doing that on your own, but involving your children? Gross. Speaking of children, Joan's adopted son Christopher is in the picture now. How did that happen? When did that happen? Well, the movie's certainly not going to tell you, and I'm pretty sure Joan had married yet again by the time Christopher was adopted, but her third husband, Philip Terry, is played by Sir not appearing in this film. Likewise for Joan's youngest children, Cindy and Kathy. They refuse to sign off on Christina's story, after all, so for legal reasons, as far as the movie is concerned, they don't exist. Anyway, it doesn't take long for Joan to start becoming increasingly strict, and that strictness soon turns into cruelty. There's a scene where Joan tries to feed Christina an incredibly undercooked steak, which she refuses to eat because she's no fool. It's raw. It's rare. Rare, my ass. That thing is practically still mooing. And when Christina refuses to eat that hunk of barely seared cow, Joan tells her under no circumstances will she eat anything else until she finishes that steak. Now, I don't have a problem in principle with the concept of you'll eat what I put in front of you, damn it, but traditionally, parents who employ this rule have the goddamn common courtesy to cook their food before making their kids eat it. This little argument goes on for at least a full day in the movie, though Christina claims it actually went on for much longer. But being the stubborn child she was, she held strong, and eventually, Joan relented and started feeding her again. I must everything be a contest. She really is quite headstrong, isn't she? Wonder where she gets that from. And Joan isn't just cruel, she's also batshit crazy, as evidenced when MGM finally released her in 1943, as her films were not as profitable as they once were. Box office poison was the term they used to describe her. She responded to this by... Grabbing a pair of pruning shears and frantically destroying her rose garden in the middle of the damn night. Okay... I don't recall sundowning being one of the five stages of grief, but... We all deal with loss differently, I guess. And she insisted her children had to get out of bed and help her because... Well, shit, I don't know. If there was a good reason for it, she wouldn't be crazy. Tina! Bring me the axe! Tina, don't get the axe! And if forcing your children to do pointless chores at midnight and subjecting them to foodborne illness wasn't enough, pretty soon all this crazy manifests itself as physical abuse. Like when Joan discovers a dress hung up in Christina's closet using... a wire hanger. Here we go. No wire hangers ever! Well, this is what you all came here for, isn't it? Of course it is. Even people who haven't seen the movie know that line, because this is sadly what Mommy Dearest is best known for. Faye Dunaway's ridiculous overacting. It's not really a constant thing throughout the movie, but whenever the script calls for Faye to get angry, she cranks it up to 11. Eddie Redmayne ain't got nothing on her. Don't fuck with me, fellas! Ooh, madam, who would dare? Now, I know we're meant to believe Joan Crawford was crazy, but this is not a crazy person. This is a caricature of a crazy person. This is what you do when you're trying to act like a crazy person in a farce, and audiences howled with laughter in response. And when Paramount Pictures realized this, they actually rolled with it and started advertising Mommy Dearest as a campy melodrama. So that's where Tommy Wiseau learned that trick. And this is why the Golden Raspberry Foundation not only voted this movie Worst Picture of 1981, but also Worst Picture of the Decade at the 10th Annual Razzie Awards. And at the 25th Razzie Awards ceremony in 2005, it was nominated for Worst Drama of Our First 25 Years, losing to Battlefield Earth. And I can totally understand why they would call this movie an unintentional comedy, because it has so many hilarious moments. For example, right after... No wire hangers ever! Yeah, that. 
she goes into a fit of rage and starts throwing Christina's dresses all over the place. And then, this is great, she proceeds to beat her own daughter with the hanger. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, it gets better. Then she starts complaining that Christina's bathroom isn't clean enough. So she drags her daughter out of bed so she can scrub the floor in the middle of the night. And she beats her with a can of Ajax. <laughs> oh, God, that's hysterical. Oh, but there's more. Oh, 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 there is so much more. This is great. You're going to love this. Years later, when Christina is a teenager, she gets shipped off to boarding school because if you're going to be a shitty parent, you might as well go all out. And she gets caught in a compromising position with the boy. Nothing actually happens, but I guess Joan decides the school isn't punishing her enough, so she pulls her daughter out. And then she tells a reporter her daughter was expelled, and when Christina calls her on her bullshit in front of the reporter... Wait for it... Joan tries to strangle her to death! <laughs> oh my god, look at that! She's trying to kill her own daughter! <laughs> She's trying to choke the life out of her! Oh my god! And they have to pull her off her because she's gone completely psycho! <laughs> oh god! She almost died! <laughs> Oh, now that's comedy. That is funny. That is totally funny. <laughs> ah. Good times, good times. So anyway, getting back to Dunaway's performance, it is... That was sarcasm, by the way. I know it's hard to tell sometimes because we are living in the dumbest period in history, but that was actually sarcasm, okay? Just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. Where was I? Oh, yes. Getting back to Dunaway's performance, it is pretty bad at times, but that's true of most performances in the film. Steve Forrest went over the top himself once or twice. Diana Scarwood, who plays grown-up Christina, was mostly underacting, which was quite the contrast with Dunaway's overacting. And Mara Hobel, who played young Christina in her film debut, well, suffice to say you could tell it was her film debut. It's not a surprise this movie scored four Razzie acting nominations and won three. Dunaway refused to talk about Mommy Dearest in interviews, though she did briefly mention it in her autobiography and basically blamed director Frank Perry for not knowing when to reel in her performance. And while that may sound like passing the buck, given that the other actors didn't do so well either, she may have a point there. Then again, that could also be the ego talking. Dunaway did have a reputation for being a diva on set. Rutanya Alda, who plays Crawford's nanny, Carol Ann, wrote a tell-all book about what went on behind the scenes while making Mommy Dearest. That's right, a tell-all book about a movie based on a tell-all book. Do I really have to say it? Oh, fine. Tell all -ception. According to Alda, Dunaway got perhaps a little too absorbed in the part of Joan Crawford. She was very demanding on set, throwing the odd tantrum, constantly berating the hair and makeup people who worked on her image, insisting she have as much solo screen time as possible, even if it came at the expense of other actors, and it often did, and forcing actors who were not in the shot to turn their backs since she couldn't stand to have an audience. The cast and crew were constantly gossiping about Faye's erratic behavior, and costume designer Irene Sheriff eventually got sick of her shit and walked off the set. So with that in mind, you'll pardon me if I have trouble feeling sympathy for Dunaway for any damage this movie did to her reputation. Sounds to me like she brought it on herself. I will say the acting isn't all bad. There's a scene that takes place after Crawford was let go by Warner Brothers, and for the first time, she actually appears vulnerable. This woman, who has always been driven and determined and in total control of everything, suddenly has no idea what to do with her life. She is completely lost and helpless. And to her credit, Dunaway totally sells it. It's gay acting. I'm scared. Now, I'm not sure if this is historically accurate. Everything I've read suggests Joan asked Warner Brothers for her release, and this makes it sound like they fired her. But credit where it's due, Dunaway's performance is pretty solid. And for a brief moment, I actually felt sorry for Joan Crawford. 
The movie has moments of greatness. And for what it's worth, she's also pretty good at playing shitface Joan Crawford. She's a much better drunk than Psycho. Well, as Christina grows up, like her mother, she takes an interest in acting, and eventually she lands a part in a soap opera. But just as things are going well, life throws her a curveball. She develops an ovarian tumor that requires surgery, which puts her on the shelf for a while. And Joan, not wanting the network to replace Christina with someone else, suggests something rather odd. She will fill in for Christina on the show until she is able to return. Oh, come on. Do they really expect us to buy that? Christina was in her 20s at the time, and so was her character on the show, and Joan was over 60. There is no way they would agree to something like that. Come on. The movie's just fucking with us now. Let's look at Wikipedia and find out what really happened, shall we? Okay, Christina Crawford. Da, 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 da. Ah, played Joan Borman Kane on the soap opera The Secret Storm, yes. Was in the hospital recovering from an emergency operation, right. And Joan, then over 60 years old... You have got to be kidding me! That actually happened?! No. No. How? Why would CBS agree to something like this? Did they really think people would buy Joan freaking Crawford as a 24-year-old? What must the viewers have been thinking? Were they terribly confused? Howling with laughter? Or did they just throw their hands up and roll with it? I have no idea. Joan only appeared on four episodes of The Secret Storm, and then the character was written off the show until Christina was healthy enough to return. I assume because the producers quickly realized they had made a terrible mistake. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find any video footage of Joan Crawford on the show, but there are some audio clips on YouTube. And even from just the audio, you can tell that not only is this person clearly not in her 20s, but the alcoholism had started to take its toll. It's kind of sad, really. Anyway, as we approach the end of Joan's life, the movie certainly gives us the impression that she and Christina have reconciled and are finally on good terms. But after her passing, Christina and Christopher find out they've been disinherited, quote, for reasons which are well known to them. As usual, she has the last word. Does she? Nope, we're gonna drag the bitch. And that's Mommy Dearest, winner of five Razzies, including Worst Actress, Worst Supporting Actor, Worst Supporting Actress, Worst Screenplay, and Worst Picture of 1981. I honestly can't argue with the screenplay or acting awards. It had some terrible dialogue, and the performances were various levels of ineptitude. And would you believe Dunaway actually thought she was going to win an Oscar for this movie? No shit, her career had been in a bit of a slump after Network in 76, and she thought Mommy Dearest would be her return to prominence. I thought I knew what delusional was. And it wasn't just Dunaway. Paramount started campaigning for her Oscar nomination before the movie even premiered. That just blows my mind. They honestly thought they had a legit Oscar contender on their hands. Imagine how embarrassed they must have been when the reviews came in. Well, don't count your chickens and all that. But despite the movie's problems, or perhaps because of them, it did pretty well at the box office, bringing in almost eight times its budget worldwide. I guess the shift in Paramount's marketing paid off. So did it deserve to win Worst Picture? Oh, probably, but not for the reasons the Golden Raspberry Foundation had in mind. I do think it's a bad movie, but I have a problem with it being labeled a comedy. I found it more disturbing than funny, to be honest, and the idea of the Razzies treating this story of child abuse as a joke is pretty disgusting. And needless to say, Christina was not amused by any of this. The point of Mommy Dearest was to bring the horrors of child abuse into the public consciousness, and the movie turned it into a joke about wire hangers. I'm trying to think of a worse way the people behind the film could have handled this, and... Nope, it's not coming. They totally screwed the pooch here. I can't give this one a recommendation because I don't even find it entertaining in a so-bad-it's-good way. It's just bad, and Christina's story deserved better.
As for whether it deserved to be named worst picture in a decade or worst drama in a quarter century, well, I got a ways to go before I can make that call. So until next time, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it.